Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another Connecting Climate Capital webinar series. We're thrilled to have a featured global thought leader, Chinua Azubike, join us today from InfraCredit, and we look forward to an in-depth discussion. To set the stage, I'd like to briefly highlight a bit of context. Um, we all know when we think about climate capital, the opportunity, but what we're here to solve for is really the funding gap. Um, you know, the, the numbers are quite clear. Um, to maintain a 1.5 degree Celsius pathway, we have considerable work to do. We are seeing enormous growth in the climate finance space. Um, especially with the likes of Chinua and other colleagues working so hard to be innovative and push boundaries to solve for this gap. But where I want to start and make it very clear is we have a lot of work to do. And that's the design of what we're trying to do here at Telesto. Uh, we are trying to bring additive thought leaders to this continuum who can help solve for different components. <laughs> a question we'll ask Chinua and we've asked others and those who've joined us is what's preventing countries from attracting a greater share of climate capital. And since there are so many stakeholders involved, we know it's not a simple answer. There's two or three sides to this coin, investors. They want to de-risk at different stages and entry points across different dimensions. Um, and they wanna make sure that those risk appetites are um, really matched with the return expectations for the type of project or company they're looking to fund. On the recipient side, what we're seeing a lot of and working on the ground to build pipeline um, is again, that lack of local knowledge of the sources of these influxes. Um, and then two, some of that elevation of different criteria to meet the investor needs. Overall, the way we'd simplify this is there's not enough connective tissue in this ecosystem. And that's what we're here working towards to solve. Uh, we are looking to build those relationships, the communication channels between investors, intermediaries, and those recipients. Um, just to make sure that there, we realize this continuum is quite broad and there's many players in the ecosystem, to level set quickly just on things you might hear from Chinua, um, I'd like to think about it in three separate buckets. One is you have your public financing actors, two is your private financing actors, and then three are the type of instruments um, that, that can be leveraged in this puzzle of climate capital. So you'll see really creative ways these three elements are coming together to drive to the climate outcomes future generations are counting on. I won't steal Chinua's thunder. He can speak to a lot of this in depth, but hopefully this can level set and we're happy to share these materials with anyone interested. And um, with that, just a brief uh, overview of Telesto's trajectory. Um, you know, our work in this space um, really has origins over the past 20 years, um, but more recently um, really focused on the US Africa Leader Summit. We host an official White House side event and Chinua, thank you to you for participating in that and we've been building on that momentum, we see this as a continued convening with curated stakeholders around curated opportunities to get to the results we're looking for. And so as we think about future opportunities to convene these global leaders, in the interim, we are, um, again, pushing on a, on a regular cadence to identify global thought leaders, um, different additive perspectives, new solutions that we can bring forward in the climate capital space. Finally, just a quick overview of what we do at Telesto. Um, being involved in the climate continuum means that um, we help entities get started and elevate their ESG capabilities. This can be from a leadership perspective or on the ground perspective. Uh, we are quite active and involved um, regarding, again, the green financing, the, capital, the climate capital instrumentation. With larger entities, organization, corporates, we think about the roadmap to net zero, and that looks different based on, again, their size, their sector, their industry. We believe that companies, investors, governments will do better if strategy is integrated at the highest level of the organization. We help them do that. And because everyone's looking for transparency and accountability, what we do comes down to data. And we do offer a solution to help streamline and improve reporting. 
So with that overview and context set, um, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Andrew, a managing director at Telesto Strategy, who will then introduce our esteemed speaker today. Thanks very much, Alex. And uh, Chinua, thank you so much for being uh, with us today. We're really excited to, to get in the conversation with you. Um, just quickly by way of introduction to the broader audience here, Chinua uh, is the CEO and managing director of InfraCredit, uh, which is a Nigerian-based company um, that provides solutions within the climate space uh, and also more broadly within the financial space. We'll get into more detail here about what precisely InfraCredit does um, and what Chinua's role and journey to get to this point has been. So I'll, I'll kick it off first, Chinua, by sort of asking you uh, to tell us a little bit more about InfraCredit and what, what it does. Uh, and in particular, I wanted to explain to the audience that InfraCredit is really a company that provides local currency guarantees in Nigeria for infrastructure assets. And just to give us a little bit of level setting here, Chinua, can you first explain to us what are local currency guarantees and what is sort of the business challenge that InfraCredit is trying to address through credit uh, credit guarantees in the Nigerian context? Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you, Alex, uh, the Telesto strategy team for the opportunity to, um, to, to speak in this very thought-provoking engagement. Um, so uh, um, on our InfraCredit essentially was conceptualized um, to address a, a market failure um, at the time. And, and this market gap was how do you um, mobilize um, long-term finance in local currency from um, domestic institutional sort of investors, largely local pension funds and insurance companies that are natural um, lenders um, to infrastructure, but are not participating in lending to infrastructure because of the perception of risk of infrastructure as an asset class. Whilst the traditional means of lending is going to banks, but banks tend to also have some constraints in terms of lending long-term um, because of the nature of their, um, of their liabilities, but also um, being able to lend at fixed rate or even comparably um, lower cost of capital than um, than these domestic lenders um, that traditionally invest in securities um, and largely government securities. And so um, the concept was essentially to um, to to design, and, and this was supported by the Sovereign Wealth Fund in Nigeria alongside um, the Private Infrastructure Development Group, um, um, Garanko, um, and subsequently other DFIs, KFW and, and AFC um, and AFDB subsequently, you know, essentially this consortium approach. But the initial solution was to design a credit enhancement um, essentially facility that can um, provide these local currency guarantees, enhance the rating, the credit rating, um, and reduce the perception of risk for eligible projects or so projects that meet a certain level of criteria and all that, um, thereby, you know, de-risking that I'm making them more attractive for these class of investors, pensions, insurance, to actually lend to those projects by investing in the in the bonds that they issue. So again, um, we provide credit enhancement largely for corporate infrastructure bonds, essentially the debt instrument through which the borrowing is, 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 is raised, a true debt instrument, um, and thereby addressing a combination of things. One is um, creating an asset class, right, for, for these institutional investors to hold on their books um, because it's a new asset class of infrastructure bonds that are now longer dated uh, because these corporates were traditionally borrowing at five-year um, tenors at, at high interest rates um, um, and also variable interest rates from the banking market. Now they're able to issue a corporate debt instrument that has a tenor of up to 10, 15, and up to 20 years. And those are the tenors that Infocredit has been able to unlock with its guarantees. And these instruments are now um, attractive because of the rating. You know, we have a AAA rating in local currency. And so as a result of that enhancement, when we issue that guarantee of timely payment of principal and interest on that debt instrument, it inherits our credit rating, thereby giving investors the appetite um, to now invest in that instrument and channel 
what ordinarily is long-term money, patient money, um, that is, you know, the contributory, um, co the contribution from the, um, from the, um, you know, from from the retirement savings account of of the, of the of the um, customers, um, which were largely in government securities, but now being able to allocate that um, into this kind of um, lending to the real economy. So by doing that, we 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 rechannel funds um, by improving the credit worthiness, reducing the perception of risk, enabling capital to flow to create jobs, support you know infrastructure development, essentially economic uh, social infrastructure development. Um, that ultimately um, would um, surface sustain the economic growth, um, you know. So, so it's it's financial inclusion because you have first time borrowers that are now able to access long term debt. It's 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 financial innovation because it's creating new instruments. Um, it's also financial deepening because it's helping to deepen the debt capital markets and also um, help diversify the investment portfolio of these um, institutional investors that otherwise. Would have allocated that money to um to you know perceive lower risk um right. government securities that are essentially not having the same kind of impact. Great. So there are a lot of really good answers in that. I want to just step back just a second here, Chinua, to to unpack a little bit all the interesting things that you said, especially since I think some of our audiences maybe not as deep into the financial world as obviously you are. So firstly, um, it sounds like what InfraCredit is trying to do is it's trying to match institutional investors, meaning these sort of very big pension funds or other entities which manage these really large uh, sections of assets under management, who are looking for stable but long-term returns with infrastructure, which is an asset class which generates those kinds of returns typically when it works well on a similar time scale. So you're trying to figure out some of the matchmaking that takes place there and how to improve it. And this is Fairly, correct me if I'm wrong, fairly common practice in a lot of the rest of the world where you see institutional investors like pension funds will invest in infrastructure projects and then sort of get this stable return of, of revenues over time so that they can, for example, pay out their pensions 20, 30, 40 years down the line. But it sounds like what you're saying is that in the Nigerian context, um, there is a market failure where there's a high perception of risk of infrastructure projects in the Nigerian context, and the institutional investors are therefore reticent to invest in those kinds of projects. And so what InfraCredit helps do, do is it provides uh, that credit guarantee and brings to it a certain level of greater credit worthiness that entices those uh, institutional investors to actually be interested in investing in these infrastructure projects when they otherwise would not. Is that an accurate characterization of, of the whole component there? Absolutely. Very well said. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I just wanted to make sure that everyone sort of was on the same page because, you know, you said a lot of great things in there and I just want to make sure it was 100% spelled out. So uh, I do have a follow-up question to this, um, which is, you know, oftentimes with these kinds of credit guarantees, you will hear... Uh, people talking about, are we crowding in investment? Are we crowding out investment? Are we giving people sort of a, a free lunch here? So why is it, do you believe that institutional investors perceive uh, infrastructure projects in on the continent to be too risky to invest in? And what is it about the credit guarantee specifically, other than, you know, they will get their money back, but how is it that you're doing just enough to get them to invest and not enough, you know, not taking it so far that you're giving them almost a subsidized uh, return on their investment? That's a very good point. Um, so I think you know the crowding out obviously comes from when um, you know the um, the risk free. Uh, return, uh, well, perceived risk-free return from the sovereign um, is is pricing. You know, it's a larger component of the of the investable assets that uh, um, institutional investors see, and as a result of that, they are not interested in investing in alternative instruments um, because they can get a good return from um, from holding sovereign instruments. Right. Um, what our role is to essentially um, unlock, um, you know, that. Um, accessibility on both ways. Um, one is for the borrower who 
ideally is doesn't have access to that market because the perception of risk is 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 high and so he can't be able to raise financing from these um investors on the other hand we're enabling these investors um, to diversify and invest in a new type of um you know um asset class that is um creating jobs um and also um, promoting economic growth because it's now capital that is actually directly going to the real economy as opposed to um, in some instances where it's largely being used for recurrent expenditure when it's when it's um, invested in other forms of instruments. And um, sustainably, how does this help the old market? So firstly, is that one interesting case study. So in 2019, we issued a guarantee for a uh, for the first 15 year green bond in, in Nigeria. And that green bond was used to finance a, um, a hydro um, project. Um, and um, this company um, accessed the market for the first time. It was the first time they were actually raising money and they used this money. Part of it was to reduce the currency risk because they had borrowed in USD and needed to you know, um, re reconfigure their, their uh, redenominate their borrowings in the currency of their earnings, which was in local, in Naira. And so we were able to, to use a guarantee to enable them raise a 15 year um, a bond um, from pension funds, largely from pension funds. Now, that was the longest tenure at the time. Now this same company subsequently um, went to the market to the same pension funds and was able to raise a 10 year without a guarantee. Wow. Now, we could see that this is a good case study of how you're mobilizing or catalyzing markets, ultimately, because what guarantees really do is build capacity. It helps to build capacity, both of the investors, but also of the, of the market, such that it's not needed in the future. So, so we were able to help this company to, to, do, to raise money a second time, 10-year financing from largely the same pension funds, but they were more comfortable because they had invested in the first one and seen how it had performed. Right. No, that's that's a fantastic case study. And I'm glad that you've actually brought up that one because it sounds like um, this is in line with where I'd like to go next, which is, you know, InfraCredit focuses on infrastructure, but infrastructure could be everything from sort of a toll road to a hydroelectric dam. And given that this is a, a webinar series focused on specifically climate capital, I just wanted to better understand from you um, what share or proportion of the projects that you are providing guarantees for uh, are in sort of that climate focused space, either through adaptation or mitigation or any version thereof. Where are you seeing this these projects going with respect to uh, climate change and climate focused outcomes? Thanks. Um, so today, I mean, last um, we we have roughly around 10% of our portfolio in um, in climate aligned projects today but um, we have a a transition strategy and a roadmap um a, a clean energy strategy and roadmap that we we um we issued last year it was approved by our board that that sets a deliberate path to where we want to achieve um net zero over the next up to 20 years um but we clear seven milestones and these milestones um, are very clearly targeted towards product development and strategic collaborations and increasing the allocation of our um, new guarantees um, that we issue to climate aligned infrastructure, energy efficient uh, projects. And we have started implementing that strategy. So if based on that plan, we intend to achieve up to 50% um, over the next sort of five to six, five years plus, um, you know, in our guarantee portfolio. Um, that are on the energy side, and um, and and this is one part that we 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 anticipate. Um, it's a it's a very very curated and strategic path to to achieving um, that you know uh, carbon neutrality and leveraging the role that in, in, infra credit type institutions. So um, in terms of mobilizing local finance um, from the capital markets and from local pension funds that can help drive um, a carbon um, you know, low carbon economy, um, long term finance that can drive green growth and climate resilient development. So that's the approach we're taking currently. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, so transitioning just a little bit to again, InfraCredit and its sort of business model here. So uh, I think it's pretty clear how, when this goes well, the institutional investors they earn a return because the the infrastructure project is generating returns over the long run. And I can see how 
the infrastructure project itself earns a return and splits that with investors. How does InfraCredit uh, earn a return in all of these different uh, credit guarantees that it provides? So we like like the way sort of insurance works. You you charge like a, a the equivalent of a premium, and so that we typically would 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 um, would price the risk. So it goes through a, an underwriting process, a credit underwriting process, where we we conduct our credit assessment, we do a risk rating, and then on the back of the rating um, of the risk of the project we're underwriting um, by way of a guarantee, we are able to allocate a cost reflective fee. And that fee is an annual fee on the outstanding debt that we guarantee for the, for the life of the exposure that we carry. So essentially that fee is meant to compensate for the credit risk that we're, we're taking on, um, plus a, 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 a spread on that. Um, and essentially the all-in cost of the borrower essentially is the, is the fee plus the, the interest rate on which they're financing now. On the interest rate side, um, it's usually supposed to be comparably less expensive than the alternative cost of funding because um, the way the market prices the AAA um, infra credit guarantee here is that it's at a spread above the risk-free rate so because we are uh, pricing at, 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 at the same rating as the sovereign, um, there's a yield pickup. And that yield pickup is somewhere between inside of 50 bips, um, I could, you know, against the risk-free rate uh, where the federal government borrows at in Nigeria. So that ultimately provides a least cost structure for the borrower, mm -hmm. um, but also a sustainable model because it, we're able to cover operating costs and also cater for the risk that we carry on our books. Um, Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I did want to return to a point. So i uh, very clear how, you know, sort of the infra credit is able to do this in a way that's financially uh, sustainable for them. But you did mention that a success factor for you will be long term, almost putting yourself out of a job. You'll be doing such a great job of providing these credit guarantees that in the future, maybe the market never needs credit guarantees again. I didn't want to put words in your mouth, but is that actually sort of a a, a, a metric that you're looking at and sort of do you believe that there is a long-term scenario where entities like InfraCredit no longer need to operate in the capital markets because it's already there? There's no longer this perception of, of infrastructure investments being too risky for institutional investors to invest in. Yeah, so I um, so I believe that that should be the vision or mission of, of similar type of entities. Because again, the reason there's a trans there should be a transition right there should be a transition in the sense that the 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 market gap that you've been established to solve um you measure against how you're ad addressing those indicators and over time you shift to a spectrum of the market that needs you more so there is obviously in every market there are segments and um, as you address a certain segment of the market you should your product life cycle. You should have the ability to evolve through your pro product life cycle. So if the life cycle is 10 years, then of course, strategically as an institution, you evolve into the next cycle of where the market gap sits. And there is always, there isn't a perfect market where there are no risks or no problems. But I think the innovative ability or the agility of the institution to continue to look ahead to see where it evolves as the market itself um, it, um, it doesn't need it um, over time. So yes, at InfraCredit, we continue to look at um, what the future should look like, the impact we, we should have, and how we organize ourselves um, at, at each point in the life cycle to continue to add value um, to the market. Um, so even if it's, and I imagine that it's going to be more going to where the risk is perceived to be higher, right? Um, or where the market failure is shifting towards or where there's a perception of a gap and being able to solve that as, as the market gets more confident on, on, on existing market sort of gaps where you have proved or been able to provide that confidence to investors and they don't need that guarantee in the future. Or maybe they need a partial guarantee um, than the full guarantee. So there's always going to be a value that um, institutions will add. You just need to be able to prepare to fill those gaps as they evolve. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. And just forward looking here a little bit, I mean, when you talk about this sort of shifting risk riskiness, I mean, we're talking about almost like sub assets within the infrastructure asset class, right? Um, are you do you see sort of the riskier sub assets over time being more of these 
kinds of infrastructure projects where uh, there's greater technological risk because it's not fully born, you know, tested in the field. And I, I'm thinking now ahead to sort of uh, the the climate angle of this and the ener renewable energy angle of all of this. You know, is this over time? Do you see right now a lot of your projects? It sounded like are in sort of the more traditional infrastructure projects. And maybe in five to 10 years, actually, all the demand for credit guarantee is in these, what are now sort of considered cutting edge projects like solar farms or things that are not fully uh, market tested at this stage. Do you see that being the case? Yeah, I mean, if you follow the theory of the fact that it's, you know, if you, um, where the market doesn't understand the risk, right, they wouldn't be able to finance that. And the, the value add of a credit enhancement or a guarantor is, especially if you're developing markets, is to understand that risk well enough to be able to attract credit or funding in there. Um, even today, right, the definition of infrastructure for less developed countries um, is evolving, right? Because when you think about the affordability, accessibility, and even the poverty uh, rate, then you ask, okay, what does infrastructure mean for the average sort of citizen? Is it distributed, you know, is, is right. it, um, you know, when you look at distributed renewable energy or distributed infrastructure solutions um, that are addressing some of the market infrastructure gaps that prevent your traditional type of, um, you know, um, projects to be accessible to these end users. And you could simply look at it from standalone sort of solar systems, um, you know, similar type of models, um, um, uh, EVs, uh, mobility that are two, three wheels and charging, uh, you know, charging stations that are, uh, that are distributed or even small scale, you know, agro processing that also is sort of distributed, but on an aggregated basis, right? It's, it's yeah. huge in terms of the market gap. So these address a significant infrastructure gap um, that is significantly even affecting in some form um, cost of food, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you think about the, the inflation uh, and how food the processing and distribution and, 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 and the cost of transportation of food. So um, it's, it opens up a, it, when you use that lens to look at what infrastructure means for, for, for developing or less developed countries, it, it does open up a wider definition and a higher perception of risk and the need for risk mitigation tools, even beyond traditional sort of guarantees where you can try and blend sort of risk and cost of funding to enable access and growth. Yeah, I, I like that characterization a lot. It almost sounds like infrastructure is a big part of the way that you're thinking about an economic development engine in an emerging market like this. And therefore, where it generates a lot of these positive externalities of creating this economic development for, and it's a public good, Therefore, the, the market risk is going to be higher and you can continue to expect that institutional investors might be uncomfortable with that. And that's where institutions like InfraCredit need to step in to make that happen. Um, I wanted to get into some of the partners that uh, infrastructure InfraCredit deals with uh, in Nigeria. You, you called out a few of them sort of in, in your initial remarks on talking about what InfraCredit does, but can you just explicitly lay out for us who are the main institutional investors that you're working with? Who are some of the uh, particular project teams that you're working with, infrastructure project teams that you're working with, and any other kind of um, stakeholders that are in that uh, spectrum that you also tend to partner with? Oh, absolutely. And maybe I'll just use, um, I'll just walk through our journey in a very, yeah, that'd be great. A way to, to use that as an example. So, um, so when InfraCredit was was established, um, we were backed by um, the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority alongside uh, Garanko, which is sort of owned by the Private Infrastructure Development Group, and um, you know KFW Development Bank and Africa Finance Corporation were uh, follow-on investors within the first um, two years of our of our existence. Um, KFW provided um, technical assistance. They're also one of the single largest funders of InfraCredit today. Um, and um, they, that technical assistance, and I'll talk about probably that later in, in the course of this, is a very key part of um, the enabling 
instrument that can help in driving market development beyond just capital, right? Um, and um, AFDB as well um, has also is also a provider of capital. Um, and then Infraco Africa subsequently came in as an equity investor. Uh, we now have one um, domestic institutional investor, a ins local insurance company, um, Leadway. On the on the technical assistance development support, we have built some some very valuable relationships. So um, we um, we do benefit from support from from Page in 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 helping with you know some of the areas that we needed. Um, some additional technical assistance like capacity building. You know, we had to do a lot of training with the local pension funds. So we did get some as technical support to support um, to to fund some of the trainings that um, from KFW from uh, and from Page with the local pension funds, um, helping build their knowledge and understanding of infrastructure as an asset class. Um, and later, and also with USAID, interestingly, we did the first co guarantee. Right in 2019, and so we did a, a co guarantee for a local currency bond, a 15 year bond with the USAID um, at that time, uh, and that to us it sort of triggered that whole risk sharing strategy for Infocredit, where we are now looking to work in actively with other development partners, where we have boots on the ground, we understand the local market, but we don't have all the capital to provide that enhancement, and we will have single limits. So we leverage off that support, and and um, we're very, very, I'm very, you know, pleased that USAID helped to to pioneer that alongside us in 2019. Um, we also work closely with USTDA. Um, so again, if you look at infrastructure, infrastructure is essentially it's 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 a cycle. It's a it's a life cycle, right? So it starts from preparation to you know to development and ultimately construction finance. So we recognize the need to partner um, to help to improve the quality of deal flow. And, and USCDA is a partner in that regard. We have a couple of successful projects where we have worked with them across the life cycle. Um, and, um, you know, um, UK um, FCDO is, is, is um, a funder, both through Page and uh, InfraCrypto, but also directly providing blended finance at the project level. And hopefully we'll talk about that as we progress, but that, is another very significant instrument that has unlocked for InfraCredit the ability to provide credit enhancement for a market that otherwise um, we, institutional investors would never have a, um, been able to invest in, which is distributed renewable energy projects in for rural mini grids. So we'll talk about that later. But these these includes a lot of the partners we work with um, in terms of partners that provide technical support in terms of technical assistance funding. But also direct financial support on our balance sheet. Um, but also, you know, I also involved in the governance in some form, depending on, on you know the equity and, and and providers. No, that's a helpful characterization. I wanted to, I did want to get into the technical assisting component since you since you brought it up. Um, concretely, what does technical assistance look like in these kinds of deals? I mean. I feel like it's a big catch-all term that can mean a lot of different things. When you are providing, you know, some instances, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of financing to an infrastructure project or trying to raise that amount of capital from a pension fund or another uh, major institutional investor, what does it mean to give these parties and stakeholders in a, um, technical assistance? Yeah, so... Very, it's a very good point. Um, you know, technical assistance, capital is, is, is not the only solution, right? Capacity, right? In terms of, you know, building local capacity or, you know, or is, is a key component of sustained impact um, of capital. And, and um, when you're intervening in a market where there is a pre-existing gap or a failure, you have to, from very inception, integrate into your solution how you're building capacity alongside providing capital. And, and this means that a lot of times we find that projects either require some additional support in improving the quality of the way they are prepared or developed. This come in the form of you know, um, environmental um, feasibility or due diligence, technical feasibility or some due diligence, or um, you know, um, some commercial assessment as well as uh, technical. So these these are um, these are inputs into um, how the project is designed or sort of built um, and and prepared. 
to ensure that it is quote unquote bankable, but also well put together so that the decision making for the lender or the investor right. is less onerous, right? A lot right. of times what causes projects to delay is the lack of, you know, satisfactory due diligence or delayed condition precedents that haven't been met because at the earlier design of the project, those tools or experiences were lacking um, in the in the early stage of how the projects were. Or otherwise, even addressing some of the upfront costs, which may be, appear to be expensive for the company, um, could prevent capital from coming because then the company is unable, or the, or the developer or the borrower is unable to pay, for example, the cost of, you know, um, the technical assessment or the, the ESG um, based on the standards that have been set. So these, these are resources. They are, they are um, essentially resources and services that improve the quality of, of projects and therefore improve the velocity ultimately with which projects can be got to find, can get to financial close and ultimately can you know, access capital and, and generate the impact that is expected. So a lot of times, um, we, what I experience is that we need to bring capital alongside you know, the sort of technical assistance, which is capacity to work together so you, you, and also when you have technical assistance, it's not enough that if you don't have capital that can either share risk or unlock other forms of capital, then you, you just do technical assistance in isolation and the project is still queuing up um, to, mm -hmm. to get capital. So it's sort of like this integrated solution um, that, that needs to, that would help accelerate. And we see that clearly that it, it, it's really working together because that way there's symmetry of information between the two pools of, of funding. Right, you're not providing technical assistance for a project that is not in demand because the funder is, is less interested in that type of project. You're actually providing TA in a form that the intermediary would like to see it so that when they go through their credit process, you're actually feeding the right inputs that would form you know, um, their outputs for them to, to actually assess um, the approvals to fund or support that project. So this is one of the lessons we've learned and the need for us to continue to build strengthen relationship with our technical assistance providers. And we have recently, I did forget that um, FSD Africa, who is one of our, our partners as well, has largely been supportive. Last year, we signed an MOU and they provide technical assistance for climate aligned infrastructure. And that has been quite valuable in accelerating the deal flow of projects that would ultimately benefit from a credit guarantee. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, the, the two are indispensable and one left in isolation without the other sounds incomplete. Um, I wanted to, to move on to uh, the topic of blended finance. It, it came up in something you said, you, you quickly mentioned it. And it's also, I think, sort of the flavor of the month right now in a lot of uh, climate capital. Everyone sort of talks about blended finance and the potential for blended finance to really play a pivotal role in catalyzing a lot more climate capital. Um, I wanted to get a sense from you uh, what you see as the role of debt capital uh, in these kinds and credit guarantees, by the way, how they might complement or support uh, blended finance uh, and how that might vary by different asset type, geography, uh, just to get your read on it from someone who's very deeply involved in capital markets, from the credit guarantee angle, um, all of this potential synergies that exist across these different kinds of ways of catalyzing more private sector investment. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and, you know, like you rightly said, um, I mean, blended finance has a very broad context. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's how it's utilized to achieve smart use of capital, but so for sustained impact, um, you know, and back to the point about how is it used to create like a guarantee example, the less need for it in the future, right? So that mobilization ratio, that leverage ratio, how is that measured um, over time? In the beginning, a lot of times it's not entirely the calculation is just, you know, how much Am I leveraging against what is? It's kind of open ended. It's not very intentional, and you can't have an exact figure to it until you begin to build out the performance data. And so, on our side, um, how did why is blending important um, within the context? 
and I'll look at it broadly. Um, one is the challenges that from a less, from a, you know, developing market point of view that we traditionally tend to deal with in at least at this point in the life cycle of, of, of market development. One is high inflation. And so there is a cost of capital problem, um, you know, for debt um, or even equity, if you find it. Um, and, um, and so that's a constraint to affordability. Um, and especially when you're trying to address underserved, unserved and drive inclusive growth. Um, secondly is, is perception of risk, which we talked about already, which mm -hmm. tends to also have a, a, an impact on, on how capital is priced, but also whether or not capital would even go in the first place. Right. And then the, the, the third one is currency, which is where local currency guarantee comes in. So when you're borrowing in foreign currency, how do you how do you, you know, match your assets against your liabilities? Now, um, where the blending comes in, it helps to address these, these, these three things, particularly the cost of capital and the perception of risk. And also, in some instances, the lack of sufficient equity. Because when you have a, a, a blended structure where there's a, a tranche that is saying I would absorb, you know, first losses as a subordinated tranche in the capital structure, that also in some form reduces the demand for excess for more equity. Um, maybe a 50% equity ratio because of the risk perception, you may be demanding, you know, a total of, you know, a higher equity co contribution from the, from the project, which makes it very difficult to access. Um, and so the blending, depending on how it's designed, um, is able to, to reduce that, in, improve access to capital, and, and then address perception of risk. But the sustained use of it, um, i.e., you know, ensuring that outcomes. So again, it goes back to performance data. How is that integrated in, from inception? That what are the indicators that are um, that you want to measure um, over time? I may not have all the answers today. A lot of times, it's not available. But I can gather that data because I'm enabling. I'm learning by doing. I'm enabling access to capital that is now creating impact that I can measure and ultimately um, improve because there's a monitoring, evaluation and learning process at that, you know, once the capital is deployed and that's where efficiency is built and, and ultimately scaling is achieved. So, um, and so it brings in debt that otherwise may not have come. And we've seen this clearly from precedent um, case study projects that we have supported where um, we're able to mobilize um, financing from conservative investors that otherwise may not have lent to that project. Um, but more importantly is that um, it allows for data to be built. And that data is the performance data that would ultimately um, be available to institutional investors to take a more informed decision and, and, and reduce the amount of, hopefully, as that data demonstrates viability. Because again, the question around viability and whether it's feasible the cost of capital plays an important role in that. Right. If at 20, 28% or 29% cost of debt, which you see here for certain type of assets, um, it's not viable or it's not feasible, right? But at 7% at, at interest rate or 8% interest rate, it becomes, um, you know, that same project is, 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 is feasible and is viable um, because, of, of, because of the interest rate. So we see that as, a, as, as one of the key you know, enablers that, that blending brings and sustainability will come, you know, over time as, um, as the impact is, the impact indicators are, are provided and the market can price the risk better um, over time. Uh, and, and hopefully we, we have that sustained growth um, because again, one of the key things that we're particularly conscious of is ensuring that it's not bringing moral hazard um, in terms of, you know, bringing the wrong behavior but driving, yeah. um, you know, driving best practice and, and financial discipline ultimately. Uh, and that's something we, we, we've learned and we've integrated into the type of blended solutions that we have implemented. Yeah, so I, I think it's a similar story to credit guarantees overall, right? These are mechanisms that are, that are intended to sort of catalyze, but you don't want them to make an unviable project that even would be unviable with a credit guarantee or with blended finance uh, attractive to the point where people pile into it, invest in it, and ends up failing. It's really designed to sort of tip the scale just enough to make it possible um, and reduce the risk. So I, I really appreciate that characterization. I really like the way that you also framed it in the context of 
this moment in time where the cost of capital is particularly elevated globally. Um, and also there is this perceived perception of, or sorry, there's perception of risk uh, in a lot of these projects. So all very helpful um, ways of characterizing it there. Um, so Chinua, I wanted to, I wanted to maybe step back out uh, into sort of the broader picture here for a second, which is to um, ask you, since you do have this perspective on the capital markets and particularly climate focused um, infrastructure, what are the major climate capital trends that you see emerging right now that you believe US or Western European businesses should be aware of um, and should consider taking advantage of? I mean, I'm happy to focus on the headwinds, but I'd also like to sort of try to give a positive spin to this and say, what are the tailwinds in the climate capital uh, space right now that investors in the global north should be thinking about uh, taking advantage of and maybe don't have full uh, knowledge of? Okay, so um, so what we're seeing, um, I mean, obviously, um, we've had interesting conversations with um, with the, with the likes of the Green Climate Fund um, and um, looking at how to leverage um, funding that is catalytic and can help to um, bridge gaps in unlocking, you know, um, deal flow um, on the ground. Um, we, you know, the, there's a lot of work I would say um, that is much needed um, in uh, unlocking, you know, climate assets at scale. Um, and um, if I look at it from the context within the region, so the West African region, the currency risk is really one of the big, you know, elephants in the room, irrespective of um, the dynamics that we, we look at. And so being able to work alongside other actors that are able to absorb some of that risk and therefore attract, um, you know, um, longer dated capital. So things um, where, you know, some of the emerging trends in terms of assets is where natural capital can play, a, you know, a role in, in, um, in looking at things like um, the nature for debt <clears throat> swap models that some of which have been um, recently done in Barbados and one other country. Um, and we're currently studying that to look at how replicable that is within the uh, regional context and also in, in Nigeria. Um, you know, uh, we have quite a lot of reserves, um, forestry reserves that could, could form a good asset class for that. And at the sovereign level, um, that, you know, could create a, a good asset class that is dollar denominated um, and could actually help in addressing some of the cost issues at the sovereign level, but more importantly, create an asset class for, for global investors to look at. The other trend I'd say is really the, the move to localizing supply chains as much as possible. And how do you sort of play in that space when you when you look at the increasing demand for funding in, in, um, in less, you know, in developing countries and the need to reduce the, um, you know the um, the emissions that are coming from um, moving um, you know products across the uh, continent to 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 process them and bring them back, whether it's um, right. um, lithium or um, cobalt or all of those um, um, products that are used to to, to design batteries and, and other solar equipment. Now a lot of the conversations and we're seeing a couple of um, you know, decisions or strategies in Nigeria where there's a lot more push towards local manufacturing. And it's probably going to be consistent across the continent. So there is an opportunity in terms of looking at investing in localizing the supply chain as much as possible within these within the country. That is one is it will be um, a major, you know, commercially viable opportunity. Um, but more importantly, it's also reducing carbon emissions. Right. Because the shipping um, emissions is is quite significant when you compare that um, to you know to the global emissions cycle. So we so these these trends uh, I'd say are, are increasingly evolving, um, and um, the carbon credit obviously has been ongoing. Uh, but observing how um, countries are resetting, how they want to 
um, account for, for carbon credits and regulate where necessary. I think we're seeing a couple of trends happening, but um, but it continues to be a, a key way of mitigating risks, um, you know, on on on, on climate projects. Um, so so I think these three these three areas are of interest. Um, I would say, particularly looking at carbon credits and and supply chains. Um, I think these could be really major, um, you know, enablers and also profit centers in the of the future. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Chinwa, last question here. We like to tend to wrap up with a, sort of a positive spin on things. Um, what excites you most about the increasing momentum around uh, climate capital? Uh, so my excitement is really driven by the fact that it's an opportunity for inclusive growth. Um, we talk about the just energy transition and what that means, um, you know, um, and, and how... Um, catalytic capital, um, but also commitments from the, you know, from, from the wealthy governments are meant to help to drive inclusive transition. I think it's a unique opportunity for, um, for developing and less developed countries to realign their, their growth plans, um, more climate resilient growth plans that is really focused on attracting this pool of funds to address, um, gaps around inclusion. So agriculture, um, potentially having a climate um, smart agriculture um, strategy. Um, we're seeing this in some of the projects we're evaluating today. Uh, secondly is, um, you know, of course, energy access and making energy access more inclusive. Um, these, these, these forms of capital that can enable that reduction of cost of access for particularly the underserved and the unserved could really drive prosperity um, if it's well structured, designed, allocated um, to um, to achieve the expected outcome. So to me, that is a is a glimmer of hope because prior to now, there wasn't that much conversation and commitment towards capital um, in soft capital. I'll describe it that way to to help drive inclusive growth. And now it's an opportunity for governments and the private sector to actually ensure that the, the mechanisms that are built to attract this capital can truly help to leapfrog development by allocating that capital where it's creating jobs where it's most needed and driving sustainable growth where it's um, much needed. So that to me is the excitement around what climate, me climate capital means um, for um for, for countries like um, in Africa and, 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 and the prospects for inclusive growth. Thank you very much for your time, Shinoa, and for uh, all of this great insight into uh, this side of, of the capital markets and particularly around those that are focused on, on driving climate growth. Uh, we really thank you for your time and looks like uh, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to connect with the Telesis Rider team and to share our thoughts and look forward to continuous engagement. Thank you. Yeah, and we're looking forward to seeing all the great stuff that InfoCredit will continue to do in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Chinua. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.